All right, there we go. Cool. All right, so word up, everybody. Uh, this is formally Dorian's mode, but we're actually trying a new uh, new thing. Um, one of my colleagues that I met at, uh, at Rikers Island, um, we decided that we work so well together that we are just changing the entire podcast format. So I'd like to introduce you all to Dee Marisa. And the podcast hey. is now known uh, as Madari Music. Madari Music. Clap with it Dee up. Marisa and Clap Dorian. It up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so um, I guess like to get this rolling, um, you know, uh, who are you? And you know, let, let's let's start from there. So who are you, Dee Marisa? And then I'll go after you. Okay, so who is Dee Marisa? Dee Marisa is a mom. She is a woman. She is a uh, community organizer. Um, she is a musical healer. Um, she is a spiritual being um, who is on assignment journeying on this plane. Um, and she is an advocate for many marginalized populations. That's who she is. Who are you, Dorian? Yeah, so, you know, as uh, some of the people who have listened to Dorian's Mode at this point already know, um, but I'll just do it as a refresher. So my name is Dorian. I'm a composer, a piano player, and a music therapist. Um, and uh, yeah, very, uh, very connected with, um, with working people, working class people, um, of, of many, many demographics. Uh, and I'm also very much a strong believer in, um, in intersectional uh, organizing. Um, there are people uh, across an entire spectrum of humanity that uh, really should be collaborating together uh, and don't realize that they should be collaborating together because there are some nasty, uh conditions that have been set up uh for for us um quite literally and uh you know a lot of what i imagine de marisa and i are going to be covering is going to be american centric uh however um we're going to learn as we interview people and chat with people and talk about different ideas that there are struggles all around this earth and a lot yes. of people that uh that yeah um that can really work together. Uh, so, yeah. you know, the 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 that's kind of our intro. Um, just to put it out there, so D and I started working together uh, at um, the Fine and Performing Arts uh, Division at Rikers Island, um, and we were both uh, really drawn towards that work. Uh, for, I, I mean, I've heard you say it, D, as um, as divine work or or. Yes. Hard yes. Work. Yeah. So, so could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? Um, so I say divine work in that I did not intentionally choose it. It chose me. Um, and in kind of saying yes to that assignment, both mentally and just spiritually, um, and not connected with any particular practice, right? Just like, um, receiving what the universe is saying in a, in, in a form of discernment. Um, I was drawn to it, but also just uh, a great fit, very impactful in doing it. Um, and it, it felt good in my spirit. Um, and so that's when I, that's what I mean when I say divine work. Like it wasn't, I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to be an arts coordinator on Rikers Island, and I'm going to do music. I definitely walked into the profession blindly, knowing that I have uh, a myriad of experience in the realm of art, whether it be um, fine art, whether it be performing art, and just dance. I mean, so I didn't really have a direction to go in, but kind of felt intuitively so that there was something that I needed to unlock in this space. Um, yeah, so that's how I would explain it. And I think in terms of it being hard work, it, it became that once, I want to say day one, right? Like when we walked in and really took in a breath of like what Rikers is and how reflective it is of my community, um, you know, it became a charge. It became a duty. 
um, to provide great work and opportunities for folks who, you know, who I'm just accustomed to seeing in my daily life. You know, on this journey, I've met folks who I've gone to school with. I've met folks who I know third person, third party, um, third party. Uh, you know, we frequent the same supermarkets. We live in the same neighborhoods. We gone to the same schools. Um, and so, you know, at that point, it kind of was a real representation of the war. And, um, you know, definitely have my place in it. Yeah, that's what I would say. What about you? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's one, one thing that uh, we really wanted to um, cover in this, uh, this new reformat um, of Madari music is that we're addressing um, spaces of creativity and healing uh, with, um, with uh, you know, I, I wanna say marginalized community and, and uh, justice affected uh, communities. Um, but I, I almost think that, you know, that there, there's an even bigger, uh, bigger space to, to navigate through. Um, you know, the, the thing about cre creative process work is, um, is that, uh, you know, the, the, the human spirit has, has been, um, use, utilizing creativity as as a, a way of, of expression like, like the thing I always say that separated um, the human being from from the other animals was the moment that we started to use our voices for something beyond um, beyond communication but actually something uh, on a deeper deeper form of expression or the moment that we uh, felt our hands touch something, and realized that there was a rhythm there and with some form of intentionality recreated that that process um you know that that's really the moment that that the human being uh started to started to to elevate uh, in a different way and i'm not saying that um other animals or other beings are not capable or uh and anything like that it's just more of a uh you know from my day-to-day -day experience is that the, the human being is, is consistently um, elevated. And uh, yeah, the, the thing about working within the, the prison industrial complex is that, um, you know, we're, we're really meeting human beings at a human level uh, because um, it was actually described in, in one of my therapy settings uh, with, with a therapist how I, I was, having difficulty uh, coming to terms with the duality of an individual I was working with um, because I, I found um, the, the criminal act that this individual had, had, perpet had, had, uh, had, had done. Um, I, I was so troubled on, a, on an ethical level uh, addressing this human being, but I also, uh, just met them, uh, you know, and they're this creative, brilliant individual, and there's just so much more to them than this uh, particularly dark space in their their mental capacity. Uh, and um, my therapist really put it, it was like, it's almost like you're seeing humanity at its both extremes, and it's all in one circumstance. And so, um, you know, I, I've found that uh, the folks that we work with on the inside, you know, a lot of them um, are, are they, they, they have this sort of facade that they've put up um, as a protective barrier. You know, it's, it's like a trauma wall. Uh, it, it's a way to keep, to keep an individual protected uh, by, by um, putting up these just, you know, oftentimes ridiculously uh, toxic masculinity like fronts um, and you know it, it's 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 a way to to protect um, the 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 fragile human being who is who is inside of, of these struggling individuals and it's just that yeah cr creativity has uh, a way of, of reaching folks uh, in a way that that 
um, you know, colonialist talk therapy is not necessarily uh, capable of, at least in the, the initial breakthrough stages. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Demarissa? Um, I mean, I think you unpacked it for me. Um, I would say, well, I would say I, I, I believe the drum, right? Just something, just take into the drum for a minute has like a unspoken connection to the spirit. Um, and when you include other elements of music, I think they have a power of activating um, emotion without words. Um, and so for me, that in of itself is why music, right? Is because I actually, it's funny because I am always in awe of the, the reaction or responses that music evokes out of the body, um, even subconsciously so. So much that like I named my son music. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so music to me, it, it's an unspoken language. It's a universal language. Um, and I'm, in my experience uh, within uh, our work, you know, it definitely broke down language barriers. It definitely gave an equal opportunity for folks to process and digest where they were currently, sometimes what they had been through already um, and fostered a connectedness where we could kind of strategize on what to do next, um, which is beautiful when you are servicing folks from different walks of life with different communication styles, with different love languages. I think that too, I think for, for most, I know there are a few people who just aren't music people, but I would say for most, music is like a love language. Um, and so, you know, when you are into, into this hard work, the one thing you always want to have at the forefront of the journey or of any practice is love. You know what I mean? And love is multifaceted, right? And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost like uh, th there's this really beautiful concept where, you know, if music makes you uncomfortable or if you're listening to music that you don't like, you're still having an emotional response. Yes. Uh, you, know, you know, it's like, <laughs> and, and, and it tells you about yourself or it tells you about your community or where you're coming from. Um, yes. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, I have one of my favorite incidents um, inside, uh, inside Rikers was there was an individual uh, who was complaining about the music of the youth of today and how violent it is and how awful it is. And this was literally in the midst of us listening to Gimme the Loop by Biggie, uh, which is literally a song about robbery and like attacking pregnant women to get their jewelry. <laughs> it's right. Like, and, you know, and by the way, I, I, I fucking love that song. Like, it's like, it's, right. a, it's, it's an amazing song, but it just cracked me up how, it was, uh, it was like, it was like, all right, man, like, you know, you're listening to music that is literally talking about the things that you're uncomfortable with in, in the modern music. So maybe there's a generational communication that, that you're missing right, out yes. on. And, and I've always found that, uh, you know, if I find music uncomfortable, like I, I listen to it like two or three more times, uh, cause you end up learning about, you learn more about yourself than you do yes. uh, than you do about um yeah you, you learn what it is that makes you uncomfortable right and, right um yeah you know I definitely went through that with um uh, Beyonce's Lemonade album I want to say was it Lemonade I want to say it was Lemonade um and so mm -hmm. while first listening to it I was like oh this is okay and then actually have gone through like a traumatic experience and then hearing those songs, it was almost as if I, I was hearing it again for the first time. Super mind blowing, like, oh, that's what she was talking about. 
wow, like I could really relate to that. Like this is real. Um, and I think that speaks to what you're speaking to, like the, you know, maybe I just hadn't advanced in my maturity yet to be able to receive the gravity of the lesson, right? And when I got there, it was almost like she was talking for me. Um, yeah. yeah, but see, that's the beauty of music. It, it, it offers just awakening and so many different facets of your life. I can even say like Tupac, the way I listened to Tupac and Biggie as a young person, it's completely different than the way I listen to it now. It's a lot more critical now. It's, you know, it's almost political education in some regard. Um, and that's how I see it now. Whereas before it was just, you know, they're, they're great lyricists and I love the metaphoric wordplay and like, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that um, just on, on that note, uh, you know, two, two artists that came to mind uh, that, had huge impacts on, on my own political education. Uh, so the first one was one I actually didn't like the first time I heard him, and that was a mortal technique. Um, yeah. And you know, like like I I heard him, a friend of mine showed me him, and I just didn't like it. Like it was like, I don't know, this is kind of corny. It's a little too like, like I'm not, I, I just don't really get what he's talking about. Um, you know, fast forward after, you know, being in the military for a little bit and hearing, you know, this guy not, not using a uh, metaphor. He's talking about very direct, like, yes. yeah, he, he's like, it's literally like, hey, the United States Army was basically funded by United Fruit and went down and tortured a whole bunch of motherfuckers in Guatemala. Like all right. of a sudden it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, the, the reason it's not metaphorical is because it's like literally history. And like, I was, right. I, I was like, at the time, the first time I heard him, I was like, so into, you know, the craft of poetry, uh, yes. that I didn't really understand that he's actually a poet, but he's not talking about poetic things. And it's like, I want right. to hear beautiful wordplay, like Nas, you know, yes. or, or someone like that. And, and Immortal Technique doesn't do that. And it's like, he's not, he's, he's getting a different point across. And it just, yes. it just all of a sudden, like, you know, it, it, it was like, holy fuck, I didn't like it because I didn't understand it. Um, yes. But then the second one is, uh, is actually Rage Against the Machine had a huge impact. Uh, like I loved them when I was in high school. Uh, Cause I was like a big, big metal head at the time, listened to a lot of metal music and, uh, and Rage was just like, it's fucking heavy as fuck band. I'm um, sorry if I'm swearing in front of your kids. I just realized that. No, they've heard worse. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I just realized like, wait a no, second. No, they're good. Words. They're in the whip with us. They're in the whip right. with us, literally. Excellent, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, R Rage Against the Machine, um, you know, like I listened to them because they were a great like metal band uh, back in the 90s. And, you know, didn't really understand the lyrics until now <laughs> you know like there's a there's a song um by rage that I'm, I'm actually let me pull the lyrics up it's called wake up it's at the end of the matrix um which is one of my favorite movies but like uh this song is about Cointel pro and i did not uh. get that i didn't get that as a kid you know like the first one it's uh First lyric, it's, although they cry to dis discredit you, you still never read it. The needle, all threatic, radically poetic, standing with the fury that they had in 66. And like you double on mad, still knee deep in the system shit. Hoover, so talking about, um, you know, Hoover from the FBI. Hoover, he was a body remover. I'll give you a dose, but it'll never come close to the rage built up inside of me. Fist in the air in the land of hypocrisy. So that's literally talking about the United yeah. States. Movements come and movements go. Leaders speak, movements cease, uh, cease when their heads are blow, are flown, because all these punks got bullets in their heads. Department of the police, the judges, the feds, networks at work, keeping people calm. And then this is what really blew my mind. You know, they went after King when he spoke out on Vietnam. He turned the power to the have-nots and then came the shot. So it's the moment, yeah, it's, it's literally talking about the moment that these people start speaking about 
about the poverty level like it's almost like they were like all right you're talking about civil rights we're gonna harass you but like you know we'll, right, we'll let that day. go yeah but like the moment he said like started speaking out against vietnam they were like oh we gotta rip this fucker up and then the moment he started speaking to the have-nots then came the shots so check this out second verse i'm gonna like kind of jump through uh to the last part so um i uh, da, 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 da. um okay so yeah several federal man who men who pulled schemes on the dream and put it to an end you better beware of retribution with mind wars 2020 visions with murals and metaphors there's networks at work keeping people people calm you know they murdered x and tried to blame it on islam he turned the power to the have-nots and then came the shot so that's about uh that's about, right. about malcolm <laughs> x and it's the same yeah. kind of thing like you know they uh they FBI literally started giving weapons to folks to get rid of Malcolm X. And in yeah. the interlude, they literally read uh, some of the text that, uh, that that was found in, in FBI documents a couple of you know, years later when they released it publicly. But uh, it goes, Black nationalism may be a brave contender for this position, but should he abandon his supposed obedience to the white liberal doctrine of nonviolence and embrace Black nationalism through counterintelligence, it should be possible to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them. Like, mm. that's, you know, that that's actual shit that the FBI was putting out there uh, just in this song by Rage yeah. Against the Machine. And, and so any, anyways, all of that fucking ramble uh, to say that um, it took a long time of maturing to really understand that the music is what drew me into Rage because it was like, you know, it was a metal band, but like mostly POC in the band and, you know, like very hip hop, very punk, like influenced. Um, and they had this really radical, uh, radical um, message that I didn't really understand when I was 15. Uh, didn't yeah. even really understand when I was 25, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have any music that, uh, that really impacted you? I know you had said Lemonade. Um, um, lemonade on a more personal level. I'm trying to think. Uh terms of community i mean i've always listened to like the lauren hills um I'm trying to think like where i don't know i'm a little all over the place with it um you know definitely a one mic fan nice um yeah i'm drawing a blank right now in terms of like what music I would say has galvanized me in the work. Um, but I will say that my relationship with music has, uh, uh, has definitely evolved. Um, it's always been a part of my healing practice, but I think as an adult, I find value in like the resource opposed to before it was just like, I know that when I'm angry, I'll put on a song, I'll feel a little better in a while. If I play a playlist, I'll feel a little better in a while. But now it's just like knowing that that's my go-to. Like, it's been a long day. I definitely need, it's a need, it's a necessity. Definitely need some music. Um, I've also been increasing my playlist of like 90s and 2000s music. And one, because I'm just an 80s baby and 90s and 2000s music was music that I had the autonomy to listen to and not listen to, right? Um, but also the feelings and the reminders of like what it was to be young and free and careless. And so I tend to live in that space often because that's what keeps me recharged. Um, so yeah, so I can't pinpoint a specific song. I'm also an R&B head too. So no, I probably don't want to hear the nonsense that I want to listen to. <laughs> now give me, some Trace, give me some Mario, give me some Neo. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, and I'm just all swooned, um, even down to, like, Escape and TLC. Um, yeah, I was also a Spice Girl fan, too, growing up. No shit. Yeah, having, no shit. My, first, my first album that I purchased on my own, my first CD, was Spice Girl, Spice Up Your Life. 
definitely. Um, wow. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I think my relationship with music has just changed. And I'm always looking for songs, even when working with artists. Um, I look for music that moves me or get, causes some sort of reaction to my with my spirit. Um, that's the music I gravitate towards. Yeah. Or, yeah. It, it's it's I've always um, just the you know the the connection to to uh, music and messaging has been um, it's just such such a such an obvious thing. You know, uh, the, the ways, um, and of course, like, I don't drink anymore, but, uh, like, one way that I always think about, like, when you go to, an, to a new culture, when you're in a new cultural space, it's like, try the food, drink the alcohol, and listen to the music, and you're going to know way more about the culture than you ever will, uh, you know, reading about it or watching a documentary. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, it's like, eat the food, you know what resources are around you know drink the alcohol you know what people do to like to cope and to party uh you know listen to the music you hear the actual truth of what's uh what's going on yeah um yeah yeah so um i just uh to keep it kind of rolling since it's our first first episode yeah. um you know i i i i was gonna ask uh what is music but before asking that i actually wanted to know like what do you think um the relationship trauma uh has on the populations that you and i work with and and um you know what what is that that connection to trauma and creativity and and human beings yeah i mean i think for you know people of color especially trauma has become a big portion of our everyday lives um sadly um you know just the the system the the ways of the world right now leave us extra vulnerable to trauma um down to what we eat down to our options down to where we work down to how we're treated at work down to our opportunities of advancement at work, um, you know, down to the resources that we have when we're parenting children, down to, you know, the justice system, breaking up our homes, you know, there's just so many layers of trauma. And then we didn't even unpack like generational trauma. So stuff that we were just born into anyway, um, that all go back to just like slavery, like we just have not healed. I think, um, like music for some is the Red Bull or like the vitamin C, vitamin D and that like the multivitamin to um, kind of give you the energy to endure. Um, for some it's an outlet and I think art in general, it's like that vitamin supplement. Um, it, it, it gives you enough outlet to get rid of the stuff you just can't take with you to be able to journey in these spaces. Um, it helps you process the stuff that like are keep that keep you stagnant, but you gotta kind of understand to move forward. And I would even say, um, for some, it gives them a purpose in a world that is constantly demeaning and constantly um, undermining talent and constantly blocking out spaces where one can be themselves or reach self-actualization or just be expressive um yeah and, and just kind of in a spirit of like just slavery and like freedom it's the thing you can take with you you know what I mean it's like a tool that you can take yeah, with totally. you right um yeah. yeah and yeah yeah that's my thought yeah it's you know um I always think about you know, you, you can't address trauma without being politically engaged. And, um, you know, there, there's a, it's like a joke in, in like the world of trauma experts, but, uh, you know, if we took into account trauma uh, with, um, with psychological disorders, the DSM would just be one page, um, yep. you know, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, 
there's transgenerational trauma that uh, is just, you know, it's so apparent uh, with so many people, you know, the, the folks we listen, uh, we, we work with and, and listen to, um, you know, their, their, uh, their intellect is oftentimes so high um but then their their emotional um coping skills are so stunted. non-existent sometimes yeah yep. yeah and and it's just you know it, it comes from i mean you were just saying you know like the food that that people eat and the environment that people are born into um and it just it really creates this ongoing um cycle of of pain and and yes. agony um yes. and yet, you know so like i'm i'm somebody who uh who has been diagnosed with ptsd and it's like number one it was just very uh affirming you know to actually get to get you know a doctor to have multiple doctors like actually like look through my case and look through my life and just be like oh yeah you you have ptsd like right you know you you should uh be treating this and it just it really impacted just uh self-care um in in so many realms but it also has made it a little exhausting because it's like there is just constant maintenance that has to be done um and you know we look at uh, like my daughter for instance and it's just like she doesn't have trauma yet there's probably some transgenerational trauma in there just by nature that I'm her father. Um, you know, but how do we how do we address it early on, you know, mm -hmm. at, at this stage? Um, but to 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 get more um into it, uh, you know, right now uh the the evidence is showing that trauma coping skills uh one of the major uh major keys uh for for coping through trauma is actually community engagement and yes. and expressing the trauma and um i actually just uh just read a thing where um it's from the the judith judith lewis herman book on um trauma and recovery where she was citing how uh, there was a study done with a whole bunch of people who had been diagnosed with PTSD and had formed a sort of a collective healing group. And one thing they actually found was that life got almost more difficult in some ways uh, because they were actually addressing their trauma and standing up for themselves. Uh, which, which is something I think uh, you and I have experienced uh, in, in, our, <laughs> in our work, uh, you know, when Definitely. it's like, wait a second, like, y'all are not going to fucking take advantage. And by the way, like, we're not talking about the, the incarcerated people. We're talking about administration. Um, word, yeah. word, but the record reflect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing where, um, you know, you start standing up for yourself and people don't actually like you to stand up for yourself. But the irony is that, you know, they're probably suffering from trauma too, but yes. it's unaddressed. So they're yes. acting like a fucking fool. I know. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyways, it's just, um, you know, trauma is a political issue uh, because, you know, look at the way that, um, you know, that your people have been and, and continue to be treated. Uh, you know, let's look at, um, you know, any veteran who's ever gone overseas, you know, you are, that war is a political issue. Um, yeah. Look at domestic violence, that's, that is a political issue. You know, the, the, the very fact that there was a Me Too movement, you know, it's, it's, it's like, that was about power dynamics. And yeah, um, so yeah, so trauma is inherently political, and if you are not actively being political, you are still being political, but just not uh, not in the good, not on the right side. <laughs> right, not in a helpful way. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, 
I got two more questions to just kind of get through this first episode so we can, you know, establish some shit. But uh, real talk, what uh, what is music? Hmm. Music is my son. No. <laughs> That's what music is. No, uh, but it is. Music is my son. Music is the center of my world. Music is my grounding piece. It's my talking piece. It's my spirituality. Um, it's my duality. Um, it's my permission to be my alter ego, my, um, my non-earthly self. It's that it's that it's that chord you always talk about. What is it called, Dorian? <laughs> uh, which the which chord, chord where the pain is? The chord where the pain oh, is. Oh, it, not not a chord. It's a note. It's the blue note. No, in, the uh, blue the, note. Yes. Yeah. Music is the blue note of life. It's the it's that space in between that like you can't name. It's where the pain is, but it's also where the triumph is too. You know, it's where the rejoicing is. Um, yeah, it's your permission. Music is your permission. That's what it is. It's it's the it's the validation. Um, yeah, it's like everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna give two different perspectives on on what I think about what music is. Uh, three. Uh, what what's up? <laughs> I said, come on, Dory. Yeah, yeah. So the three three definitions. First definition is music is De Maurice's son. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, but um, I'll, I'll give it sort of like a technical definition, and then uh, more of a spiritual definition, uh, or at least a spiritual identity. Um, so my technical definition is that music is any form of organized or expressive sound through interpretation of human intervention, which is probably mm. the most Dorian fucking thing you're gonna hear me say today. But, yes. uh, but the, way that, <laughs> the way that I think about it is that, you know, when a bird is singing, uh, the bird on its own terms is not necessarily making music. A bird is communicating to other birds or, you know, it, it, it's using it as a, as a, as a practical sound. Whereas when it's the human, and I'll actually change it to sentient intervention, uh, but when, when a sentient being hears the bird and interprets it as music, it becomes music. Um, so, so it's, you know, uh, a bird is not necessarily making the singing sounds for musical purposes. It's, it's for communication. Uh, whereas, you know, I literally uh, open my window up and just listen, you know, two birds, and it it puts me in a state. Uh, so that's my like technical answer. Um, but on a more spiritual answer, you know, personally, it it it, it is my spiritual practice. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of joke that I'm a I'm a musical Taoist or a musical Buddhist or you know some something in that realm, but. One thing that uh, I found so interesting is when asking the question to folks that we're working with uh, who are incarcerated or uh, with some of the dance people that I work with. I teach a class at the Martha Graham School, uh, their music for dancers class, and I always ask the question, what is music? People who do not do music uh, in a, you know, capitalist form of professional uh, will they pretty, I will say, consistently define music as it's something from within. It's something you connect that's bigger than yourself. So it's the sort of cosmic energy. Come and on. Yeah, it's just, it's so wild because, you know, like we'll hang out with Crips, we'll hang out with Bloods, we'll hang out with, you know, people who are in protective custody. Uh, we'll hang out with modern dancers or ballet dancers and you ask that question and you get the same answer, which is yep. music is something from within, but it's something bigger and it's a connection of within to that bigger thing. 
And, okay. you know, like the reason I put the technical definition out first is because like, you know, I, I do like to think in that way, but on the flip side of it, uh, that is an answer that I learned and like shaved and crafted to get to versus when I was a kid and getting into music had nothing to do with that. It was right. about that inner connection to something larger. So, yeah. so, so that's what I think music is. Um, and that's actually why I think music has healing capabilities uh, for mental health um, in certain regards that, uh, that talk therapy is just not quite able to access. Um, no, I mean, there's also just no judgment in music. Like, think about it. Have you ever listened to a song and felt ashamed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. See, I've never <laughs> listened to a song. I've, I've now, I'm not saying that there's like, you don't, you can't get consciousness from music, like clarity, right? So I've true, definitely true. listened to a song and been like, dang, I did that. Or dang, I can relate. Or, you know, yeah probably brought me back in touch with my younger self my heyday um but even in that it's a it's a it's a two-sided relationship with yourself it's your it's, your, it's a relationship with your it's your conscious meeting your subconscious and so to me personally there's no judgment there there's no real judgment there. Maybe some processing, but like you're not ready to throw the book at yourself for some 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 shit you heard in the song, right? It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, it's an opportunity to reflect, and I think that's the beauty of it. It's the yeah. beauty of it. You can think, be imperfect in in music. I think uh, just to clarify what I was saying uh, in response to that, when you asked if I ever felt judgment, and it was like actually the music never caused that. That that was me judging right. myself it's like the music right. may have opened that that that, that you know, portal yeah. passage yeah that passageway that portal uh but it's not um the music itself didn't do that music just right. shed, it just shed light on my own being right right and that's the beauty of it music is the one space where you're not going to find judgment music and babies <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep. yeah you're right well, it's so, you know, there's, um, do you know the band, the Insane Clown Posse? No. So they're, um, I don't think you'll like them. Uh, <laughs> they're uh, really, really, uh, they're, they're, they're a horrorcore like hip hop group from Detroit. Um, okay. And they're another group of white rappers, not Eminem. Uh, but uh yeah, skill level it. we'll just say skill level uh as mcs is like the antithesis of what Eminem skill is they're they're not very sk skilled dudes and uh they wear this ridiculous clown makeup um and not the clown makeup yeah 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 well so anyways um this is an exercise i i give to students which is find music you hate and listen to that music for four days straight and then decide why you hate it like explain you know it's like really get to know it so anyways i did that to myself with the insane clown posse because it was like i i just i don't get it like i do not get this music and the reason i'm bringing this up is after listening to it for four days i started to realize that um it wasn't making sense to me because it wasn't about my community and in fact it's from a part of my community <laughs> that I'm like almost ashamed of because it is literally targeted at poverty level, low income urban white folks. And, Got it. and that's the entire messaging. And when I actually started to listen to the songs and the, the messaging that they're talking about, it was like, yeah, like their lyrics are ridiculously stupid. And like the gimmick is absurd and like the beats are, not not good <laughs> um however <laughs> however like they're talking about domestic violence and the right. problems so it. they're talking yeah yeah and it's just like it's like it, it just as as we were talking about a moment ago it's like the reason i had the reaction i did was because 
I was like, oh, these are, this is about the white people that I like have issue with. Like, you know, you know that, yeah. that were my own classism. Like they're the people who are a class below me. And, right. and you know, where I can empathize almost with, uh, with folks of other demographics, like if it's my own demographic, I still sh have this shame. And it, it right. was like, a, it was like a big eye opener because it like made me go, okay, whoa, like you just did the thing that you said you're never going to do and you're still doing it right. at this unconscious level to the point where when, you know, asking your own question, what music do you hate? This is the music that came up. And yeah, so like we were, I, I listened to it with some friends and like it was one particularly about domestic violence and my friend literally looked at me and he was like man I gotta be honest I don't disagree with this at all <laughs> it was like yeah and so like it was like yeah the the you know we're looking at it through the wrong lens like it's yeah like, it's like yeah the the aesthetics aren't aimed at Please. people like me yeah it's, it's not aimed for people like me but it's like but the yeah. message I'm on board with true right yeah, I hear you know. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> that exactly that. It's don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. 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 Dang, music is just awesome. I mean, they have yeah. like just music just says, thank you. <laughs> so there's uh there's let me just like um find these lyrics here, uh. They have a song. Um, yeah, like th this song is about the Confederate flag. It's called Confederate flag and it's by the insane clown posse. And it goes, I'm in an old station wagon deep in Alabama, wipe the sweat out of my eye, cock the hammer. I see a pickup truck with a rebel flag window, a skinny red neck with one of his kinfolk. I pull up alongside and blast the passenger, blood feathers and bones, a fucking massacre. I kept shooting, hit the driver. He fell in the horn, stuck, threw a mol Molotov cocktail and blew up the truck. I say, fuck your rebel flag. Like, I actually don't disagree with that. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah and yeah it, it's yeah i say fuck your rebel flag that represents a hateful sense i say fuck your rebel flag it's it's if it's in your back pocket i'm aiming my rockets i say fuck your rebel flag that's what you want to wave i'll stick you in your grave i say fuck your rebel flag stick the fucking flag right up your uh f hole um, <laughs> <laughs> so. but yeah like yeah, rednecks call it pride, pride for white, white pride for slavery. It sickens my gut. I see the that flag as a challenge that you want to fight. I don't care who it offends. You say it's your right. Well, it's my right to sock you in your dead lips. Put a foot on your neck until you eat my dick. <laughs> no matter where you live, uh, you should hate that flag because it represents evil bickets. Tell them, shags. <laughs> so it's like yes. Like it's you know the lyrics are not not exactly poetic and right. if you actually but, but like real. I I don't disagree with the message at all like it's real yeah definitely <laughs> I t I t <laughs> there's a lyric I mean just to show you like some of the like corny rhyming but it says I uh, I turn a redneck into a dead neck <laughs> oh Jesus yeah cut the head off a chicken get your ass a kickin so. <laughs> Redneck fucking meth head, tuck you in your fucking deathbed. Oh <laughs> so, Jesus! Yeah, yeah, we're gonna so yeah. we're gonna leave that where it is. Yeah. So you know, it, that's key for effort. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's the thing. It's like it's like I don't disagree with like putting that message out into the community they're reaching out to. Right. Right. It's like, right. 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 Because it's relatable. Yeah. Well, and and the, that's that's a group that's susceptible uh, to to bigoted symbology uh you know um and they don't even know they just don't even know that they're being played uh and so right. yeah, like i don't know yeah of course our first episode i brought up icp just to make everyone uncomfortable but <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> not sorry guys yeah <laughs> so let's um let's finish it off with one last question okay um 
And, uh, you know, so what is your philosophy or like, what is your code of ethics? Hmm, what is my philosophy? What is my code of ethics? Um, I think it is, so first, always grounding myself with the Sada, right? It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Always, that's my ground in peace. Secondly, I guess it's a bunch of quotes. Secondly, two, two men standing in a burning house must not stop to argue. And I would say third, one benevolent adult has the power to change the trajectory of a child's entire life. Um, and I think those three things summarize my work, right? Like, this is not a choice as a person of color. It is not, my, it is not a choice. Um, it is the only option, right, is to do what's right morally. It is to fight for equality for my people. And it is to give whatever resources, whatever talents, whatever gems I have, whatever wisdom I have away. Um, and the other part is, you know, if, if, we're, if we're infiltrating, if not, if we're operating within a system together, we must never be distracted enough to fight amongst one another or to be against one another. And to me, that's not about color. It's not about culture, right? I think our situation was a real example of like, you can just be two people lost in a system, you know, but solidarity is most important. When something is wrong, when something is um, harmful, when something is not conducive to your mental health or the mental health of others, you owe it to yourself, but you owe it to the larger community. You owe it to your legacy to do something about it. Um, and I think the last, you know, when in terms of like mentorship, um, I've learned on my journey, the importance of having people to journey with. And so I'm thinking that in life and through music, especially, it's an opportunity to journey and you just should always be ready to journey because sometimes your, your next level of self-actualization is on the other side of that journey. Um, so you owe it to yourself being your greatest self, but you also owe it to the community and you owe it to the universe and the energies that keep you going and thriving to always be ready to journey. Um, yeah, and I think that's what I live by. You know, today, uh, a gentleman who I was servicing in Rikers Island found me on Facebook and called and was like, hey, you know, how can I get some supports? Like, I need services. Um, and that is big, you know, for, for me to have been in a space not very long and impact people to the point where even after closing that chapter in their life, that one of the things they took with them is a memory of me. That is a testament to the work, right? Um, and I think, you know, but it, it also speaks to the journey. And, and I, I think a lot of people go into this work wanting to fix people, heal people, but also hold each other accountable, like give some accountability. And sometimes it's just loving somebody through their tough times. Sometimes it's always meeting people where they are. And it's understanding that like some stuff is not a 24 hour turnaround. Some things, six sessions ain't gonna be enough. And you gotta be okay with that. Yeah, so that's my thought. That's my philosophy, if that makes sense. It does. <laughs> Is, uh, okay. is, that, is that individual still inside? No. No, wow. No. Wow. So you, you had that much of an impact on them. Yes, yes. He actually wow. remembered um, HALA, which is the organization that I work with, do a lot of work with. He remembered me talking about HALA. So oh, he man. hunted HALA down on Facebook and has been writing them messages all week to get in contact with me. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah, it's so yeah, uh, you know, just just to answer the, that question as well, I got, you know, kind of like my tenets and my values and, you know, my tenets are 
empathy and accountability because you know you can you can literally meet people where they're at uh and you can also simultaneously hold people accountable um for for their actions you know it's uh you know as as two individuals here with trauma you know obviously we understand the empathy of of having trigger attacks and um you know panic attacks and all those all those different things but we also realize we have to hold ourselves accountable it's not a freebie to go and treat people badly um and when we do we gotta own up to it you know i uh have really uh had to be accountable um with engaging the you know, ways i've engaged with my wife in the past specifically due to trauma um you know just uh being ultra defensive about things or uh like things that she clearly was not intending to to be harmful or hurtful but i just took it that way uh because i was triggered by something um you know, and I'm also trying to make sure to hold myself accountable with my daughter. Um, uh, but, you know, it's the same thing with uh, you know, a lot of the folks we work with inside. Uh, you know, there, there are so many people that they're, they're struggling, you know, they're in their journey. Uh, but, it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's just cool with whatever they, you know, may have, have uh, done to another human being. But, uh, it also, uh, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go, go, go. I'll oh, jump yeah, in. I, was, I was just gonna say. I mean, that's you know one of the issues with the United States is uh, I don't think the culture is willing to hold itself accountable. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, how long? How long? uh have we i mean we we committed a genocide literally uh and okay. then we kidnapped people uh well sorry we wanted to enslave the people that that lived here uh when we realized that they knew the land better we genocided them and kidnapped other people and brought them here instead you know to disorient yeah. and uh you know that's that it's still the, the accountability still has not been followed through with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, you, you were going to say? Um, yeah, I was going to say, I was having a conversation with my mentor today, mm -hmm. Corey, and uh, we were talking about how society, well, just healing with our families and like how you can't really say that you're good and you're healed when like your family is just still caught in mad matrices and still mad fucked up um, and how it's important for us to heal collectively. Um, and we got into the topic of like how us, especially as a people of color, but just society too, view formerly incarcerated people and chemically addictive people and how we, we harp on those things and alienate those people and force them to live in shame. But he was saying those are like low hanging fruits in the grand scheme of like the ills yeah. of our community. You know, they're, to be honest, in one ways, the victor, I mean, the, the, the victim, right? Because all of those are, are byproducts of systems of oppression. Like though they're all victims of crime generative factors, right? Mm -hmm. Let's be real. And that's, even down to the most egregious offense, right? Like if we're, even if, and you know, don't want anybody to be triggered, trigger warning, but like, even if we're talking about folks who have committed some sort of sexual assault, right? A lot of those things come from untreated mental illness or, or abuse, mm -hmm. right? One of those generational mm -hmm. curses. And we definitely talked about how, you know, as a derivative of slavery, like those are things that people of color just don't talk about because you can't. Your family has been broken down and watered down so much that you don't really want the police coming in getting Uncle Tom 
or Uncle Joe. Like you don't want to come, you don't want the police coming in to get them because you don't want to surrender your family to the punishment system, even though mm-hmm. Uncle Joe did something really bad, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so and so that said, um penalizing and, and not saying like and definitely not justifying, but also not judging. Because we, you know, we, Dor- Dorian and I, as professionals who have built really good close bonds with folks and relationships with folks inside, find the need to constantly say, like, we're not excusing anything that people did. But, like, I'm not excusing it, no, because I don't get the right to. That's for the victims of the, the crimes. That's for, you know, the person, the individual to excuse themselves for or not. But what I am saying is lean into that humanity. Yeah. Because harping on those people, that's low hanging fruit. Oh, yeah. Well, it, the- it's, it's like, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, they, they said it at that event um, yesterday. Stop blaming the victims. You know? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's uh, violence it's is violence. That with me. Yeah. Violence but even violence. the fact that we feel like we got to give that disclaimer every time, like, yeah, we all know that violence is violence, right? And like, yeah. harm is harm, and like, no discredit to anybody um, who has lost someone in the war, but understanding that we're at war too. We're at yeah. war. Yeah, you know, exactly. these are things that were planned to happen when a lot of these young people were in their parents' stomachs before they were even a thought. Yeah, exactly. You know, and we gotta we gotta hold accountability equally in the same way that we are, you know, enforcing incarceration, and we are, you know, rallying against gun violence. We also need to be talking to legislature about the conditions of communities too, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Because that's the real fruit. That's the that's the root of the tree. That's the root of the tree. Is the the communities that people are growing up in, right? And so on that, I'm a, I'm gonna end because I'm about to get my soda bag. <laughs> I was going. I was channeling my soda energy. Yeah. Don't be quiet. Yeah. So I, I guess to finish on on my end is uh, you know the three words I use for my values is uh, service, truth, and nuance. And yes, you know the reason why it's actually in that order is uh, you know service. The, the, the goal is is to be of service you know that's that's how that's how I think uh, human beings find meaning is uh, yeah. being in service to others you know a spiritual practice reason why we talk about spirituality versus religion is religions an organization spirituality is a is a verb you know that that's that's the way you are that's that's how you communicate that's 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 your action words and and so, uh, you know, I, I would rather uh, be in service to folks than to be in disservice with folks. Uh, yes. And inaction is disservice. Uh, but secondly, you know, the reason I, I, I think of truth as the second point is truth is not an objective reality. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people don't even know that they're lying to themselves yet. And so, you know, you're going to hear uh, lots of, lots of just uh, <laughs> complex perspectives of reality. I'm not going to say uh, one thing, you know, just to say we're not, we're never going to say specifics about people we work with. We're more going to talk anecdotally and change names and not give specifics, right. but there's an individual uh, that we worked with, um, older individual from, uh, uh, I'll just say like the medical unit who um, is a person who you could just tell that they were not telling the truth, you know, specifically about their situation. Um, uh, however, uh, this person's also was, uh, is, is very much fighting a battle because they actually think, and, and I actually agree to some extent uh, that what they did uh, that got them into the incarceration system was protecting a family member. And, uh, you know, so it's like, of course, like, like, th- this person's a good person. So they 
don't really have the skill set of uh, of lying, um, so they're not very good at it. Uh, however, they know that if the uh, you know facts of the matter come out of the situation, they're going to go away for a couple of years, which they don't want. And I honestly don't even think they deserve it. Uh, but you know, the point is, is that you know, truth is secondary to service because uh, truth doesn't really matter. Um, Come on, Dorian. Uh, yeah, in the human to human, uh, yeah, it just doesn't matter. But then, but then, uh, you know, the third part is nuance. It's like there's nuance to all of this. You know, we were talking about, uh, you know, people who have committed sexual violence. You know, they're often victims of sexual violence themselves, and it's there's just you know so a person can both be a perpetrator and and a victim all at the same time um yeah there's i mean there's uh there was an individual i was working with who you know lost all their income i'm not sure exactly what they did but they lost all their income at the pandemic and this individual and some uh some friends basically decided to hold up a liquor store to get some money and none of them had any experience uh so they were they were like really bad at, at robbery like they just they literally weren't good at it and they got caught immediately uh and now they're all you know they've been in jail for a year and are probably gonna go upstate uh and it's just there's a lot of nuance to it because it's like yeah, yeah sure motherfucker committed robbery like i get that however you know what were they doing the robbery for like, like right what what did what do they need? What what did they what advantage did they see of doing something like that? It was like it was to right. provide for their fucking family. Like right. So in some way. Like, right. Yeah. Right. So and that's the so, yeah. part, that's the part we gotta, you know, that's the the, the part that we gotta get to is like why are people having to rob commit robbery to provide for their families? Exactly. Right. Like where are we failing folks? Um, but I definitely feel like that's a that's a that's a that's a episode in of itself <laughs> mm-hmm. word yeah so oh, yeah. you know this we're good. in the midst yeah in the we're in the midst of setting up our patreon account uh yes. you know i don't know if by the time this drops it'll be up yet but uh you'll find it in the show notes the info no matter what uh you know it'll be put up there again uh my name is dorian wallace and I am D. Marisa. Yeah, and we are the, uh, I guess, creative directors of Madari Music. Madari yeah. means to heal, and music means whatever the fuck you want it to mean. That part. <laughs> yes, definitely. And, and thank you for journeying with us. Um, this yeah. is day one of many, episode one yeah. of many. We're going to have some great um, hosts, um, guests to come in and just chop it up with us get in the whip y'all gonna hear me constantly say get in the whip that means that you on board with us but anybody who doesn't know um so we're gonna have, definitely have some people get in the whip with us and, and give some great wisdom um and we're yeah. gonna talk about some really good stuff yeah and you're gonna hear uh especially me get uncomfortable and sheepish and then Dee marisa say shut up dorian just <laughs> say your thing yeah, and then yes yes definitely Uh, but yeah this is uh not only is this um going to be educational regarding you know some of the topics we cover but it's also educational in the way human beings should act with other human beings and how to how to hold yourself accountable because you know i must i must say this to you know my my fellow white folks who are who are going to be listening to this is uh you know, y'all got work to do. Uh, we all do. Right. Um, but we all do. If you're not working, if you're not working on yourself, like things aren't going to get better. Like, right. you know, where and understanding that when it does, if it doesn't get better, it hurts you too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's the part. It hurts you too. Yeah. Um, we need this world to be better and equal and fair for all of us, mm-hmm. right? Because there's just on so many levels the unbalance of it. It's costing us all to live uncomfortably and to be unhappy and just so many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But also just like human to human, we're all humans, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so at that basic level, yeah. um, yeah, we're just exactly. going to continue to be unbalanced. Yeah. Yeah. So with that yeah, being said, so- we are Madari Music. And catch yeah. you next time. Stay tuned. Thank you.